Have you ever experienced a moment in your life that was so painful and confusing that all you wanted to do was learn as much as you could to make sense of it all? When I was 13, a close family friend, who was like an uncle to me, passed away from pancreatic cancer. When the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more, so I went online to find answers. Using the internet, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer, and what I had found shocked me. Over 85 percent of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2 percent chance of survival. Why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason today's current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique. That's older than my dad. But also, it's extremely expensive, costing $800 per test, and it's grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. Learning this, I knew there had to be a better way. So I set up a scientific criteria as to what a sensor would have to look like. In order to effectively diagnose pancreatic cancer, and what I had found was an article that listed a database of over 8,000 different proteins that are found when you have pancreatic cancer. So I decided to go and make it my new mission to go through all these proteins and see which ones could serve as a biomarker for pancreatic cancer. And I had snuck in this article on these things called carbon nanotubes, and that's just a long, thin pipe of carbon that's an atom thick and 150,000th the diameter of your hair. And despite their extremely small sizes, they have these incredible properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. And while I was sneakily reading this article under my desk in my biology class, we were supposed to be paying attention to these other kind of cool molecules called antibodies. And these are pretty cool because they only react with one specific protein, but they're not nearly as interesting as carbon nanotubes. And so then I was sitting in class, and suddenly it hit me: I could combine what I was reading about carbon nanotubes with what I was supposed to be thinking about antibodies. Essentially, I could weave a bunch of these antibodies into a network of carbon nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one protein. But also, due to the properties of these nanotubes, it will change its electrical properties based on the amount of protein present. However, there's a catch: these networks of carbon nanotubes are extremely flimsy, and since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So that's why I chose to use paper. Making a cancer sensor out of paper is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I love. <laughs> you start with some water. Pour in some nanotubes, add antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. <laughs> One of the best parts of the sensor, though, is that it has close to 100% accuracy and can detect the cancer in the earliest stages, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. And so, in the next two to five years. This sensor could potentially lift the pancreatic cancer survival rates from a dismal 5.5 percent to close to 100 percent, and it would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. By switching out that antibody, you can look at a different protein, thus a different disease, potentially any disease in the entire world. So that ranges from heart disease to malaria, HIV, AIDS, as well as other forms of cancer, anything. And so, hopefully, one day, we can all have that one extra uncle, that one mother, that one brother, sister. We can have that one more family member to love. Four years ago, today exactly, actually, I started a fashion blog called Style Rookie. Last September of 2011, I started an online magazine for teenage girls called RookieMag.com.、Um, my name is Tavi Gavinson, and. The title of my talk is still figuring it out. <laughs> so、um, I edit this site for teenage girls. I'm a feminist. I am kind of a pop culture nerd, and I think a lot about what makes a strong female character.、Um, and you know, movies and TV shows. These things have influenced my own website. I've said that I wanted to start a 
website for teenage girls that was not this kind of one-dimensional strong character empowerment thing because I think one thing that can be very alienating about a misconception of feminism is that girls then think that to be a feminist they have to live up to you know being perfectly consistent in your beliefs never being insecure never having doubts uh, having all of the answers and this is not true and actually uh, reconciling all the contradictions I was feeling became easier once I understood that feminism was not a rule book, but a discussion, a conversation, a process. And this is a spread from a zine that I made last year when um, I, I mean, I think I've let myself go a bit on the illustration front since, but <laughs> yeah. So what I want you to take away from my talk, the lesson of all of this is to just be Stevie Nicks. Like, that's all you have to do. Because my favorite thing about her, other than like everything, is that she is very, has always been unapologetically present on stage um, and unapologetic about her flaws and about reconciling all of her contradictory feelings. And she makes you listen to them and think about them. And yeah, so please be Stevie Nicks. Thank you. It was just an ordinary Saturday. My dad was outside mowing the lawn. My mom was upstairs folding laundry. My sister was in her room doing homework. And I was in the basement playing video games. And as I came upstairs to get something to drink, I looked out the window and realized that there was something that I was supposed to be doing. And this is what I saw. No, this wasn't my family's dinner on fire. This was my science project. Flames were pouring out, smoke was in the air, and it looked like a wooden deck was about to catch fire. I immediately started yelling. My mom was freaking out. My dad ran around to put out the fire. And of course, my sister started recording a Snapchat video. <laughs> this was just the beginning of my team's science project. My team is composed of me and three other students who are here in the audience today. We competed in First Lego League, which is an international Lego robotics competition for kids. And in addition to a robotics game, we also worked on a separate science project. And this was the project that we were working on. So the idea for this project all started when a few months earlier, a couple of my teammates took a trip to Central America and saw beaches littered with styrofoam or expanded polystyrene foam. And when they came back and told us about it, we really started thinking about the ways in which we see styrofoam every day. Get a new flat screen TV, you end up with a block of styrofoam bigger than the TV itself. Drink a cup of coffee, well, those styrofoam coffee cups are sure going to add up. Styrofoam is considered a non renewable material because it is neither feasible nor viable to recycle polystyrene. And in fact, many cities across the US have even passed ordinances that simply ban the production of many products containing polystyrene, which includes disposable utensils, packing peanuts, takeout containers, and even plastic beach toys, all products that are very useful in today's society. And now France has become the first country to completely ban all plastic utensils, cups, and plates. But what if we could keep using styrofoam and keep benefiting from its cheap, lightweight, insulating, and excellent packing ability while not having to suffer from the repercussions of having to dispose of it? What if we could turn it into something else that is actually useful? What if we can make the impossible possible? We knew that if we were successful, we would be helping the environment and making the world a better place. So we kept trying, and failing, and trying, and failing. We were so ready to give up. But then it happened. With the right temperatures, times, and chemicals, we finally got that successful test result showing us that we had created activated carbon from styrofoam waste. And at that moment, the thing that had been impossible all of a sudden wasn't. It showed us that although we had many failures at the beginning, we were able to persevere through them to get the test results that we wanted. And moreover, not only were we able to create activated carbon for purifying water, but we were also able to reduce styrofoam waste, solving two global problems with just one solution. Now, I wanted to start with the question, when was the last time you were called childish? For kids like me, being called childish can be a frequent occurrence. Every time we make irrational demands, exhibit irresponsible behavior, or display any other signs of being normal American citizens, we are called childish. 
which really bothers me. After all, take a look at these events. Imperialism and colonization, world wars, George W. Bush. Ask yourself, who's responsible? Adults. <laughs> Now, what have kids done? Well, Anne Frank touched millions with her powerful account of the Holocaust. Ruby Bridges helped to end segregation in the United States. And most recently, Charlie Simpson helped to raise 120,000 pounds for Haiti on his little bike. So as you can see evidenced by such examples, age has absolutely nothing to do with it. The traits the word childish addresses are seen so often in adults that we should abolish this age discriminatory word when it comes to criticizing behavior associated with irresponsibility and irrational thinking. <laughs> Then again, who's to say that certain types of irrational thinking aren't exactly what the world needs? Maybe you've had grand plans before, but stopped yourself thinking, that's impossible, or that costs too much, or that won't benefit me. For better or worse, sweet kids aren't hampered as much when it comes to thinking about reasons why not to do things. Kids can be full of inspiring aspirations and hopeful thinking, like my wish that no one went hungry or that everything were free kind of utopia. How many of you still dream like that and believe in the possibilities? Sometimes a knowledge of history and the past failures of utopian ideals can be a burden because you know that if everything were free, then the food stocks would become depleted and scarce and lead to chaos. On the other hand, we kids still dream about perfection. And that's a good thing because in order to make anything a reality, you have to dream about it first. In many ways, our audacity to imagine helps push the boundaries of possibility. For instance, the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, my home state, you who Washington, uh, has a program called Kids Design Glass, and kids draw their own ideas for glass art. Now, the resident artist said that they got some of their best ideas from the program because kids don't think about the limitations of how hard it can be to blow glass into certain shapes. They just think of good ideas. Now, when you think of glass, you might think of colorful shahuli designs or maybe Italian vases, but kids challenge glass artists to go beyond that into the realm of broken-hearted snakes and bacon boys, who you can see as meat vision. <laughs> Now, our inherent wisdom doesn't have to be insider's knowledge. Kids already do a lot of learning from adults, and we have a lot to share. I think that adults should start learning from kids. Adults and fellow Tedsters, you need to listen and learn from kids, and trust us and expect more from us. You must lend an ear today because we are the leaders of tomorrow. Now, the world needs opportunities for new leaders and new ideas. Kids need opportunities to lead and succeed. Are you ready to make the match? Because the world's problems shouldn't be the human family's heirloom. Thank you.